Hello, Nick. Hi, Mon. How, How are, are you? you? I'm, I'm good. How are you doing? Wonderful. Well, thank you for the taking time uh, to talk to us about uh, home networking. Uh, home is really important and increasingly important part uh, of the network edge. And uh, a lot of IoT uh, discussion these days surround smart homes. So it'd be great to understand a bit more about uh, how is home networking doing today. So you are the expert on that subject. And uh, may I start by first asking you, Nick, uh, how is access network, uh, say, in the United States doing today? Right. So actually, uh, broadband internet access is, is proliferating uh, uh, quite rapidly. I, I think, uh, you know, in, in the U.S. Um, uh, alone, there's something like t at least uh, 200 million uh, broadband access users, and, and, and rates are actually increasing pretty rapidly, 25% a year for, for fiber penetration, and something mm -hmm. like 10% a year for, for cable. Uh, so, um, particularly in, in, in sort of urban and suburban areas, the penetration is, 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 is quite good now. Um, there are still rural areas, of course, that lie behind a bit, and, and there are, but there are uh, federal initiatives that, that are aiming to address those as well. Um, so um, uh, the Obama administration has actually made this a, a, one of its priorities, and I think we've seen a lot of um, uh, a lot of progress over the last few years. Mm. Uh, what about the performance of uh, the access part of home network before it gets into the home, but just in the process getting in there? Um, we have heard a lot of different ways to measure and make sense out of quantified. Uh, evaluation of broadband performance. What's your uh, view and your data on that? Right, exactly. So that's actually what I, I spend a bit more of my time working on is actually performance measurements. And, and there, as you point out, uh, there, are a number of, uh, there, there are a number of things one could measure that affect the, the home network performance. And one of them is the access link. Um, there are various ways to measure that. Probably many of, of, your, of your students have, have used something like speed test. Um, and there's mm -hmm. you know a website people can go to to measure their performance that way. The problem with doing that, um, just from from your from your laptop or any host for that matter, is that there are a lot of confounding um, uh, issues. I guess you might say when you take such a measurement uh, from your laptop, it could be, for example, that the wireless uh, network from wherever that person is taking a measurement uh, is uh, congested or um, subject to interference. It might be that uh, there are just a lot of hosts on the, the network at the same time uh, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So when you collect a measurement just from the host like that, um, it can be a little difficult to get an accurate measurement of say, what's the access link speed? What, what's the speed that, uh, you know, that an access um, ISP like a Comcast or a Verizon or a um, Vodacom or, or whoever is, is, is actually giving you? So what we've done in our, our past work is actually uh, instrument a uh, home router so that uh, that router itself can directly measure the throughput of the access link. So as opposed to measuring other mm -hmm. things like what's going on in the host or the home wireless or other things, you can directly measure the access link. So you get sort of more direct and more continuous measurements of the performance of that link. Mm, that's an excellent measurement methodology there. And uh, what are some of the take-home messages you discovered? Right. So. Um, there are a few few interesting things, I guess, that sort of fly in the face of, I guess you might say, uh, networking 101, right? One is you, you often sort of um, learn about latency on internet paths, right? And, and, and I guess that's one thing too, right, is that latency turns out to be very important. As consumers, uh, we, we focus on throughput, right? Am I buying 50 megabits per second or 100 or 250 or what is that? But actually, the latency that your host sees to a particular site can often be the dominating factor, right? Mm. So one thing we saw is that, like, as the throughput of of a link basically increases beyond about 16 megabits per second downstream, web page loads stop actually getting faster. And you mm -hmm. might think, um, you know, that that might be a little surprising, right? Because uh, you think, hey, faster link, I should presumably get, you know, faster page loads. But because web page loads are uh, web page objects are small. Uh, what you often get is, you know, the TCP connection can't actually open up its window before the before the object transfer is over. So the transfers often become dominated by latency. Right? Mm -hmm. So one of the, I guess, the sort of 
uh, you know, sort of consumer myths, right, that, that we learned uh, is, is perhaps, uh, you know, as I said, a myth is, you know, to get better performance, all you need to do is, you know, up, upgrade the throughput or the speed of, of your ISP service plan. And in fact, that's often not the case. Latency can be a dominating factor. Um, another thing is the latency itself. Uh, you know, we often think of latency as being, you know, a factor of speed of light, mm -hmm. for example, and, and maybe queuing, right? Um, and we sort of think, oh, yeah, well, there's queuing. In fact, um, buffers in certain routers and, and network devices can actually be quite significant. Um, mm -hmm. There's this concept that's been dis sort of discussed both in research literature and in the popular media called buffer bloat. Um, and that particular phenomenon means that um, uh, end hosts don't see, don't see signals like packet drops to slow down fast enough, so they'll fill these buffers in the middle of the network, and then as a result of these buffers that are pretty big getting full, it's kind of like your packets start waiting in line, mm -hmm. right? So you see um, uh, very high latencies in some cases on some of these links. Sometimes it's a function of the a modem that your ISP is giving you. So mm -hmm. we saw some cases where the modem that the ISP gave the user is such that the buffers are huge, and the way that you'd see this as a consumer is you upload a video to YouTube or a, uh, a bunch of photos to uh, Flickr or Facebook, and then all of a sudden your connection is, is, is just completely terrible because what's happened is the buffer has filled up and the rest of your connections, like your web or your gaming or whatever, is seeing high latency. And I think the last thing we learned is actually that you know, in studying these home networks, we actually see you know, sometimes the performance problems are neither of these things. It's actually not the ISP's fault, and it's you know, it's not buffering in, in one of these devices. But in fact, it's the user's home wireless network that's actually pretty terrible. You know, there, um, there are cases where many cases, particularly as you get above about service plans of about 25 megabits per second downstream, that the user's home wireless is just you know configured in such a way that it can't even support any higher rates than that, no matter how fast a uh, speed they buy from their ISP. Mm. About this in-home networking you just mentioned here, especially with a more and more uh, home consumer IoT devices in there, the home is quite a complicated networks. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what was the most interesting uh, discovery that uh, your research has produced in studying in-home wiring or wireless uh, configuration. Uh, what should a, a consumer uh, like myself uh, be doing or not doing uh, when it comes to home network? So that's a good question. I mean, I think one of the one of the things that we've looked at in our work is like uh, you know, uh, as as you alluded to, is what's actually going on in the home network as far as like you know how much are people using connections and um, you know what performance are they are they seeing and what kind of devices do they have and so forth. One of the things that we looked at um, specific to your question is um, different spectrums, right? So uh, many consumer access points that you buy can can operate in the, uh, particularly in the U.S., okay? Um, you can operate on the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum or the, or the 5 gigahertz spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, and many access points, many old access points that you buy only have the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum and also many devices that you buy actually only operate in 2.4. Um, so if you have an access point that will you know, uh, operate in 5 and you have devices that operate in 5, actually we saw that the performance in that uh, frequency band is, is quite a bit better for kind of obvious reasons, right? It's just it turns out to be less crowded. So you know, if all your students take this advice, and switch to five, maybe we won't see those kinds of, uh, you know, those kinds of performance differentials. We definitely saw five performing a lot better. As far as like, you know, policies and, and other things and what, what this implies, I mean, there's certainly a case for opening up more spectrum because, you know, 2.4, as we know, is incredibly crowded. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, with more devices inside the home there, um, what do you see as potential uh, implications to how people use the bandwidth. Um, in fact, uh, uh, I heard that you have studied uh, how people use bandwidth today, uh, what applications and what kind of consumer behavior is driving their usage on the edge of the network. That's a great question and that's that's actually something that I, I don't think I have um, you know, a final answer to. Um, but there, this is a really important question um, which is, 
you know, how fast uh, uh, of, a, of a speed do we really need um, in the home, and how are people going to use those faster speeds? Because, uh, you know, for example, if we look at what, what Comcast has done, you know, in the United States over the past several years, it has, you know, doubled the downstream throughput of, uh, you know, at, at its higher service plan offering just about every year for the, for the past at least five or six years. And now up to like 250 megabits per second down. You know, there's Google Fiber out there, right? And, and we have the FCC and others saying, yeah, we really need faster, faster speeds. But what are people actually using it for? So one of the things we noticed um, thus far is that um, once you get above a certain uh, um, um, s speed tier, uh, people tend actually not to, to, you know, not to max out that speed all the time, right? And, and I think certainly in the, in the upper ranges, um, you know, 100 and, and, and higher, it's, it's very rare that you see, you see, you know, 100% utilization. And what we haven't really got a good answer on yet, um, so first of all, we know it's not video, right? You can stream a 4K video, um, you know, and that's only going to be, um, you know, um, 4 megabits per second or something like that. So that's obviously not going to fill the pipe. So what is? Um, file, bulk file transfer, of course, we know will, but other things... Um, I guess it remains to be seen what those things are. I think um, something's going to fill it, we know, because it always does. <laughs> I think we're right now, at least we see provisioning, at least at the upper service tiers, slightly ahead of people's ability to fill the pipe. But sort of, uh, you know, as, as your course is probably talking about, with the proliferation of, of different kinds of devices and things like cloud backup even, right? So things like Dropbox, right? That's presumably... You know, you drop some huge files in, in a, you know, a, a, in a Dropbox, and those suddenly start sinking to the cloud. Um, you know, those things uh, could could very easily fill those pipes. Mm. Well, one more question, Nick, uh, about security, uh, network security, information privacy of uh, home networks. Uh, that could be a weak spot. And are there good solutions? I think actually right now this is is, is fundamentally kind of scary <laughs> uh -huh. because you have a you have devices that are, are essentially fundamentally unpatchable, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So you have devices that um, you know maybe running Linux um, as well as services, web servers, other things like that. You think about like a digital photo frame, right? Mm -hmm. And it's going to do things like maybe it has a web server to serve up photos. Um, maybe it is downloading firmware <laughs> uh, upgrades and things like that. But um, suppose it has a software vulnerability. Mm -hmm. um, presumably, the vendor of that device is not going to rush to push out patches because that's just not what they do. And yet, the user's totally happy with the device as well because all it's doing is serving some photos, right? Does that perfectly well? Probably not overly concerned about the security of their of their photo frame or lamp or what have you. And yet, um, I think just a week or two ago, we saw an example of a uh, refrigerator that was sending, uh, uh, you know, basically a part of a large spamming botnet. Um, so I think mm -hmm. what we're going to see is that these devices are not things that people are used to securing, and they're also not things that the pe the vendors who sell them, uh, you know, are, are know anything about securing. Um, so I think we're going to have a lot of devices that are very hard to patch, or in some cases maybe impossible to patch because the interfaces don't permit it. And then what we're going to be faced with is, given that these we're going to have a ton of these devices on the network that are insecure. How are we going to basically stop attacks, both um, you know, on the devices themselves as well as other kind of attacks on privacy, like data leaks? Yeah, well, that certainly is a very challenging and uh, right now somewhat scary uh, problem. There, uh, well, gives a lot of stuff for uh, researchers to work on. Uh, yeah, there's a lot to do. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you, Nick, for taking the time. I appreciate absolutely. the chance yeah, to talk to absolutely. you. Absolutely, my pleasure. Take care. Okay.